Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about our cyber future with science writer Michael Korest. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki. That's me. Episode number 95, recorded on Thursday, May 12th, 2011. I am Machine. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki. This is episode 95. I am machine. What does that make you think of? Well, I hope it makes you think lots of interesting thoughts and that maybe we will address some of them in the next hour as I speak with my guest for the day, Michael Korist. He is a science writer who is also part machine. So we'll get his thoughts on the title as we move into the show as well. We today, I just want to spend this one hour, one expert, one show. You know how we do it. So I hope you're ready to start talking about our cyber future and our future connectedness. Are we all going to be connected all the time through technology? Are we going to have neural interfaces that allow us to not have to hold on to an iPhone, an iPad, an Android device, whatever your, your device of choice happens to be? How are we going to work in the future? Well, Michael Korist has done a lot of research and written a couple of books. And he might have some information to let us know which way our future is going. Michael Korist is a technology theorist with an unusual perspective. This is from his bio on his website, michaelkorist.com. His body is the future. So that's where we're starting, starting off. In 2001, he went completely deaf and had a computer implanted in his head to let him hear again. This experience inspired his first book called Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human, in which he wrote about how mastering his new ear, a cochlear implant, enabled him to enhance his creative potential as a human being. He earned his BA at Brown University and studied computer programming, Renaissance drama, and cultural theory on the way to his PhD at UT Austin. His second book is Worldwide Mind, The Coming Integration of Humanity, Machines, and the internet. And in the book, he ups the ante, proposing that humanity can incorporate the computer into its collective soul in a way that enhances communities and creative work instead of diminishing them. He's also written for Wired, The Washington Post, Technology Review, and The Scientist, among many others. He's written a screenplay for a TV special on brain implants, which aired on PBS in January of 2007. And he also sits on external advisory boards for neuroscience research at Northwestern and Brown, has given over 85 talks at institutions such as Google, MIT, Stanford, Brown, the Brookings Institute, and the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Michael to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. Well, I'm very excited to get you on the show. We met uh, initially little over two years ago at a really interesting conference called the Conference on World Affairs. And we sat on a number of panels together. Um, and in those panels, I got the opportunity to learn a lot about, uh, about uh, what you have gone through and your own life experiences. But I'm just to start off the show, can you talk a little bit about how your life experiences have influenced your direction as a technologist and as a science writer? Sure, sure, Kiki. So let's play with that, that title, I Am Machine. And in fact, just before the show began, the title was I Am A Machine. So Kiki took out the, the article. So we can talk a little bit about what that all means. So I went deaf back in 2001 and I got a cochlear implant. And in fact, 
if you take a look at the cover of my first book, which I've actually got right here, you can actually see the cochlear implant embedded in, in, my, in my skull right, right there. So this was actually a computer chip that has 16 electrodes that are connected to my auditory nerves. And it artificially stimulates those auditory nerves to give me a simulacrum of hearing. So I'm completely deaf. So I'm hearing this interview through the mediation of my cochlear implant. So that was really the, the experience that launched me on this inquiry about the integration of humans and machines and the internet that started with that first book that is taking that step with my second book, Worldwide Mind, which just came out two months ago. And you can see this is the title uh, around the cover, Worldwide Mind. So no cool x-rays on this one, just, uh, you know, the sort of Michelangelo, two hands touching. But this book is where I up the ante to talk more generally about what does the future hold in terms of human machine integrations? And uh, let's just let's just go forward with that. Um, I mean, do you think people are afraid of where we're going with human machine integrations? Is there is there fear that we sh that that we need to uh, that we need to address? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. You can't open up the New York Times or Discover or Scientific American these days without reading various articles saying the internet is dissociating us from each other in its fragmented communication. People are so glued to their devices that they are losing that human touch. So this is very much a cultural fear that's with us today. Now, I just want to give a little bit of contextualization because I did my doctorate in the humanities, so I read a lot of stuff, which gives me some historical perspective. So if you go all the way back to Plato, which is 2,400 years ago, Plato worried about the impact of technology on communication. He was concerned that the invention of writing would lead people to depend on the written word for knowledge and spend less time actually interacting with human beings in the flesh. So this is not a new fear. The fear has been with us really since the beginning of civilization in the way we think of civilization. So what's happening now is really um, an upping of the ante where we now have technology that are truly omnipresent in our daily lives, where we can carry them about with us, where they are really integrated to the fabric of our lives in a way that older technologies were not, like TV and, you know, and books. These were things that we had to sit down with and spend time with, and then we went back out into the world. Right. But the reason that we have these fears now is because these palm pilots and blackberries are so much a part of our lives that we no longer can live without them. Now, in your situation with your cochlear implants, the, this is this is this technology is now a permanent part of your life, and it allows you to do. Uh, to hear. It allows you to do something that was impossible for a time. And are you looking forward to the next generation of these implants? Would you be willing to uh, take your implants and instead of just a radio transmitter that transmits the audio signals from things in the environment to your cochlea, um, actually be, be, you know, a Bluetooth device or something that could uh, transmit more complex informational uh, data. Well, let's get very concrete about cochlear implants for a minute. So cochlear implants, they're not a science fictional technology. It's a very real medical technology that exists now. So right. what, what happens with cochlear implants is very much subject to the marketplace, to you know the fact that companies need to make a profit making these things. So the focus is very much simply on facilitating hearing. And I really don't hear people at cochlear implant companies talking about more exotic possibilities like enhancing hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in fact, the market has been surprisingly static for the past five or six years. There's really been only incremental improvements in cochlear implants. So it's not the kind of feel where you hear people you know, creating all these futuristic scenarios. It's really just about trying to create a simulacrum of hearing as far as is possible. But if somebody were trying to create 
something beyond a device simply for hearing. If they were creating an implant uh, that could could connect you, say, direct instead of um, you know having to hear through speakers or headphones like you're you're currently doing, that could connect you directly uh, to your computer or to your your mobile device. Would you be interested oh. in something like well. that? Well, I, I did that all the time when I first got the device. Then I got tired of it and, and moved on. Um, <laughs> that that actually that actually is that actually is possible. So the mm. device I have, there is a plain old microphone. So you know, I'll just take this off for a second so you can actually see the device itself. So so you can see that um, this little thing there that is the microphone that picks up sound. So yeah. that mic sits in the shell of my ear, and so. Anything that goes by ear, the microphone picks up. Anyway, it is possible to put a jack that will go, that will put sound directly into the processor from a computer so that I get the sound input directly from the computer without it ever traveling through the air as sound waves. So mm. that that's not exciting. That That's all, that's all technology. <laughs> so, but, but I think to address your question, more in the spirit in which you're asking it, would I be interested in enhancements? Would I be interested in technologies that would give me hearing that is better than normal? Right. Now, at this point, the technology is not available to do something like that. It's not possible to give somebody superhuman hearing. If it was available, would I do it? And the answer is probably not. And here's why. So the, the sort of $6 million man, well, really bionic woman, you know, Jamie Summers, okay, bionic ear that can hear a whisper at 500 feet away. What that show didn't talk about was that if you can hear a whisper at 500 feet away, you can hear everything else and you will get deluged by sound, completely overwhelmed. The fact is that the human ear, as an evolution designer, is an unbelievably sensitive device. And if it were to be more sensitive, it would actually be frightening and distracting and upsetting. There's a good reason why the ear evolved the way we, it did. There's a good reason why we don't hear like dogs. If there was a reason for human beings to hear that way, we would. So I'm not really interested in the kind of enhancement where you simply take something that exists and make it better. Mm -hmm. There just really isn't any need for that. I'm much more interested in the kind of enhancements which allow human beings and human bodies to do things that have never been possible. And that's what my book, Worldwide Mind, is about. I try to imagine entirely new forms of communication. So I'm responding that way to help shift that discussion over from these naive ideas of, oh, let's just make the human body superhuman. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a much more productive discussion is to talk about how technology enables entirely new forms of communication to evolve. <laughs> What areas, uh, what, what have you found from talking with scientists in the laboratory that you ended up uh, writing about in World Wide Web? What areas uh, are possible? What, what areas are people looking at and investigating currently? Okay, well, what's being investigated currently is, is medical technologies. Okay, so there's important divisions to be made here between enhancement technologies, which don't exist, which aren't science fiction in the true sense of the term. They have fictions rooted in science as being developed now. And then there's medical technologies, which actually do exist now. So that's a, there's a very strong distinction here. So the kind of technology people talk about now are things like brain implants, then it might ameliorate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And actually those do exist in some primitive form now. It is possible to put electrodes inside the brain to shock parts of the motor cortex that will actually ameliorate some of the symptoms. It's very crude. There's lots of side effects. It doesn't work in everybody. But these are very real things. There's also discussions of retinal implants, which are like cochlear implants, except you put the electrodes in the back of the retina instead of inside the inner ear. And you electrically stimulate the back of the eye in order to create a simulacrum of vision. That mm -hmm. technology is much less far along the cochlear implants. It's much harder to do than cochlear implants. But when I go to the lab today, these are the kind of technology that I see people talking about now. They're basically trying to help people who have grave impairments to, to be functional again in the world in various ways. In terms of how far they are developed, what are some of the difficulties that, um, that the retinal implants are, are coming up against? in comparison to the cochlear implants or, or other, other implants um, that might be under study right now? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's such an 
interesting question because you would think cochlear implants have been around for at least 30 years. So where's the retinal implants? You know, where's the mm -hmm. stuff that helps blind people see? Where is all that stuff? And it turns out that cochlear implants are kind of the low-hanging fruit. They were mm -hmm. essentially an easy technology to develop. Now, when I say easy, that's a very relative term. It took 40 years of research and development. But retinal implants are nowhere near as close. And one reason is that it's very difficult to stick anything onto the retina and make it stay without damaging the back of the eye. The retina is an extremely delicate uh, tissue. It's like wet tissue paper. It tears very easily. It's very difficult to stick something on the back of it that will stay in place. The other big issue is that we really understand very little about the way the retina encodes information and sends it to the brain. And because we don't know very much about that, it's very difficult to electrically stimulate the retina to give the brain visual percept that it will understand. So people who have these trial retinal implants, they can see in some limited sense. They can see, for example, the shape of a window. They will see the brightness of the window compared to the relative darkness of the wall around it. They will see where doorways are. They can see where people are. They can see where trees are. So they have something that is a useful kind of vision. And for them, it helps a great deal. It's a lot better than actually being blind. But it is so much harder to understand the neural code of the eye than it is of the ear at, at this point. And it's just the area which a lot of research is being done trying to solve those problems. Yeah, people in the chat room are, are, are mentioning a lot of ghost in the shell type, uh, making a lot of ghost in the shell type references to the stuff that we're discussing currently. Mm -hmm. in, in the implants that are being, uh, being developed, there's obviously some amount of, um, uh, you know, there are algorithms at work or some kind of um, computer intelligence that's, uh, that, or programming that's, that's inherent in the interface to allow um, the interpolation of some kind of uh, actual light input to what is sent to the brain through the through the retinal implant or um, sound input to what's sent to the brain by the cochlear implant. Um, you know, do you do you think do you see there being any kind of room for these ghosts in the machine? Yes, indeed. So yeah, you know, we can start talking about the whole ghost in the shell mythos, you know, that whole way of thinking. Um, so let, let me talk about how, how I come at it. Okay, by the way, I'm just going to sort of peek over the IRC every now and then, just to see <laughs> if I see anything really interesting coming out. So I'm going to try and do that. But, but here, here's the basic idea. So, so the brain is this phenomenally complex and successful informational machine. So we know that if we can send input into it electrically or various other methods such as optical stimulation, we can, in theory, make the brain believe it is perceiving things which have no counterpart in reality. So that's kind of the basic ghost in the shell idea right there. By the way, I watched Ghost in the Shell for the first time maybe six months ago, and I found it a very difficult movie to follow. I did not find it very philosophically coherent. But anyway, right. but the basic idea is that you can, in principle, make the brain believe that it is experiencing things, things which have no counterpart in reality. Okay, so what could those be? Well, one of the things that I talk about in my, in my book is what I call synthetic perception. Okay, synthetic perception. Mm -hmm. Well, what the heck does that mean? So here, here, here's the basic idea. So when you see an apple, you are able to recognize it as an apple, and you do it effortlessly. It's very simple for you. And computers have a very hard time doing that, but we'll set that aside for the moment. The brain is very good at recognizing objects, and recognize percepts like redness, softness, people's faces. In fact, the brain has a very specific area devoted to face recognition, the fuse of form, face gyres. Right. So we know the brain has neural machinery that represents these ideas in some way or another. Represents the idea of an apple, the idea of a dog, the idea of a wife, the idea of your particular wife. All these things have some kind of correlate in the brain. So in theory, if we can find out the specific set of neural circuitry that represents an apple, a, 
your wife, a dog, whatever, and trigger, stimulate electrically or by some other means. It will give the brain the sensation of having seen that or thought about that or experienced it in some way. Okay, that's the basic idea that I talk about in my book. So if you can get at those concepts in the brain and trigger them, then you can make people believe or experience those percepts of appleness or redness without actually having seen them. So that's the idea of synthetic perception. Okay, so, all right, great. So you can do that. So what? What's the point? <laughs> well, the idea is that it allows, it creates channels for people to communicate with each other in new ways. So let's mm -hmm. say this is a fictional scenario that I talk about early on in the book. Let's say that I'm walking down the street and my brain is connected to this internal device that observes what my neurons are doing. And it knows that when this set of neurons fires, then I'm perceiving an apple. When this mm -hmm. set of neurons fires, I'm perceiving a fire hydrant, a car, what have you, okay? Mm -hmm. And then if there's someone else, say on the other side of the world, who is connected to my brain's output, then their device can evoke similar percepts in their brain, cars, fire hydrants, a bright sunny day, whatever. And they get some kind of simulacrum of what my brain is experiencing. Now, mm. this kind of communication is something that requires a great deal of shared context. So they would have yeah. to know beforehand that I'm walking down the street. And they would, if they get the sensation of appleness, you know, okay, I'm seeing an apple. I'm seeing this particular person. And I mean, these particular sensations. So that's the basic idea behind what I call synthetic perception. And the point of it is, is that it can allow people to have some idea of what another person is experiencing yeah. as opposed to what they're saying, as opposed to, you know, what their facial expression is showing. So it would allow for a new kind of communication, which is imagistic, intuitive, sensory, rather than verbal or, or visual. So that, yeah. that's one of the core ideas of Worldwide Mind. So let, let's stop there and let's you know, let you bring in some questions. And I'm going to take a look at the IRC channel and just see what people are saying about it. That's really interesting. I've never done an interview. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, that's a fascinating con concept to be able to uh, experience what somebody else is experiencing. And this is something that um, comes up quite often in the I, in, uh, in, 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 I guess, uh, cognitive conversations, how do you experience, have somebody else's experience? How do you share an experience um, if you're not actually there? Um, in these, with this synthetic per, uh, perception, will individuals be experiencing their own concept of appleness? Because so when, when some, or will they be experiencing the same Appleness is this is this but, something that will really allow shared experience or is it something similar? So I know what an apple is to me, and someone else knows what an apple is to them. That person will then experience their own apple. That's a great question. That's that's exactly right. And in fact, I compare it to storytelling in the book. So think when somebody tells you a story, you know, let's say they tell you a story of something that happened to them in their childhood, like you know they saw a dog and they played with it. So when you hear that story, you are never going to know how they actually perceive the event. You aren't going to insert your own concepts of dogness of childhood. They say, I was walking down a dark road and I saw a big dog. You may imagine a great game where, in fact, the dog they saw was a large poodle. Okay, But in a very real sense, that doesn't matter. What matters is the narrative. What matters is that that person is telling a story that they are creating a narrative shape and you are using your own brain concepts to make your own sense out of that out of that narrative so in very real sense the way you ask that question is the way we have always communicated we have always had to use our own inbuilt concepts and use them to sympathetically imagine what someone else is telling us. And I imagine some kind of perception is being able to add another dimension to that kind of storytelling. It does yeah. not mean that people have this kind of flawless 
um, adamic language, a perfect language that allows for perfect communication. That's never going to be the case. That will always be beyond reach. But this would mm-hmm. allow a new kind of communication. Now, another important kind of communication that I think about in the book or write about is emotional communication. That's where I was so, going to go next. Yeah, I was thinking if yeah. you could feel what somebody else is feeling. That's something that the shared emotional experience is something that could be so much, so beneficial to communication. That's actually that's actually the biggest single thing that I talk about in, in Worldwide Mind. So I, I start by talking about the fact that we already have excellent hardware and software for knowing what each other is feeling in person. Okay, the face is an incredible interface. Um, Neil Stevenson made the point really well in Snow Crash. He talks about how avatars have really good representation of the user's face because it is such a good medium for communicating what a person is experiencing. But in order for that interface to work, you have to be able to see somebody. You have to be in physical proximity with them. Now, think about something like Twitter, which is really introducing a very new kind of communication. Twitter tends to be emotional. It tends to be off the cuff. It tends to be what people are seeing and feeling and thinking at that moment. So you can get a sense of people's shock and anger when there is revolutionary unrest in a place like Libya when there's an earthquake or a tornado or a hurricane, you immediately get a sense of that emotionally on Twitter in a way which has really never been possible before. So I imaginatively riffed on that idea of Twitter to say, well, if we could glean information about emotional states, which you can do to some extent by looking at the activation of the amygdala, for example, which modulates strong emotion, fear, the fight or flight response, and get some sense of what people states are and here's the thing you can summate them so you can get a global sense of what groups of people are feeling so this could work in the context of a small team and I have a scenario about this early in the book we have this military team where what's really crucial is for them to know what each other is feeling are they in pain are they alert are they startled are they bored and that information allows that team to act with a speed and coherence that really isn't possible any other way. You can only have that kind of coherence now if you can actually see each other in a very small area. So I talk about this synthetic emotional communication as a way of adding a new dimension to a sense of human community. Um, Now, I just lost your audio and video, so I want to check. Are you still with me here? I'm still here. Can Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Can you see me? Yeah. Yep. It is. Okay. Um, you're, you're, okay. the, the video is fine, so maybe it's a hiccup on, on your end. And it yeah. hopefully will write itself. Okay, but yeah. that's fine. I can fly blind. I fly <laughs> deaf all the time, so I can fly blind for a while. As, as long as I know you're seeing me, that, that's fine. Okay, so... So in the book, I tried, the book is a science fiction in the best sense. It is an imaginative extrapolation of technology that exists now in the laboratory and cultural trends that are also coming to being, such as Twitter. And I try to put those together. So let's, let's, uh, let's see what, what's going on on the IRC channel and let's see what questions you have about that. There's an interesting question from GL Desader. He asks, how difficult would it be to transfer a memory from one cyborg to another, um, assuming we can get enough understanding of the brain to do so. How could the other person experience the same memory? Wouldn't it have severe issues of synesthesia since very, uh, since everyone's brain would be wired differently? That's that's a great question. And actually, I talked about that in detail in the book. So first, have to think about what you mean by the word memory. Okay, so it can really mean two things. It may mean many things. Let's just start with two things. First, it can mean a kind of global memory, you know, a memory of playing in a particular playground when you were a kid. Memory involves many, many different things. You know, your mother, sand, the, 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 the fire truck that was there, all that sort of stuff. That's a whole scene. And then there are memories of individual things, of individual objects. That's something kind of different. So when you ask this question, I think you're you're talking about these global memories, these broad memories of scenes. Mm -hmm. My answer is you really can't, okay, because this is very interesting. Research and memory shows that human memory does not work by, um, it doesn't, it's not like a tape recorder or a video camera. The human brain does not record scenes and replay them back with perfect fidelity. 
What it actually does is it assembles bits and pieces that it already has and it puts it together to recreate the memory. It's really yeah. striking. We, memory does not work in the way people think that it does. Yeah, so, that's one. That's something that I find really interesting is the uh, uh, the concept of when you're remembering something, your brain is actually reliving the experience. So the same neurons that were activated when you experienced it the first time are activated as you're remembering it. And so you can actually introduce errors into your memories by remembering them. Yes, exactly. And there's been a lot of very interesting research where you can literally give people false memories um, yeah. just by changing the way you question them. And I talk about that, actually, it's quite some length in the book. There's a very interesting experiment where these college students were shown a video of a car accident. And they were asked afterward whether there was broken glass on the scene. And two different groups were asked this question, but they were asked it in different ways. And one group said that they remembered seeing broken glass on the scene, the other one didn't. But the only difference was how the question was phrased to both groups. So the two groups remembered that scene very differently, depending on how they were asked to imaginatively reconstruct that scene in their mind. So to come back to the question, I don't think it'd be possible to like mentally beam a memory of mine home complete into another person's mind. I don't think that will ever be possible. But I do think that by gathering the components of memory, okay, you know, say a person that both people know in common, a room that they both know in common, that that they could that one person's brain, or rather one person's online implanted rig, would gather these elements that this memory consists of the person's mother, this particular room, this particular time, then evoke the same memory traces in another person's brain, which would be which might be represented in a completely different way neurologically. Okay, the you know two brains do not map onto each other in any fine grained way. But as long as those people share those sets of concepts in common, you can make the receiver understand that the thinker is reconstructing that particular memory in their mind. It's not a complete reconstruction. It's not an accurate reconstruction. But as with storytelling, it's close enough to close that communicative gap. So I would like to see if, you know, if the person who asked, asked the question feels that I've actually answered their question. So I am <laughs> watching the, um, see I'm if he watching this. Says yeah, so, you know, so, so weigh in and see if you feel that I've answered the question. As a matter of fact, I just, I, I see there's in search of memory. Uh, mm -hmm, Kiki, by Eric Kandel. Is, is, is that you, Kiki? Did you type that? No, somebody I else did. About, I talk about Eric Kandel's book at length. In, in the book, I talk quite a bit about memory. So the book delves quite deeply into the neuroscience of memory. It talks about ways in which we can imaginatively use what we know about memory to think about how to communicate in entirely new ways. Yeah, I think that understanding how memory works um, will allow us to be able to develop, you know, these these new methods of communication. Can we use um, uh, like you said, if you remember things in a in an image based way, can we can we put together these these online stories? Can we put together um, this this? I guess the storytelling is a really interesting way of of developing it. Um, well, the way the way I put it, that there needs to be a shared context between yeah, exactly. the sender and the receiver. They need to both know that they are thinking about the same thing in that particular moment. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be like sending random words from one person to another. <laughs> Popcorn. <laughs> yeah. yeah you might us, say. It just that wouldn't that it doesn't make sense in the in the conversation. Where did that come from? Yeah. So right. there, there would right. definitely right. have to be the shared context. So in the case mm -hmm. of a memory that you're putting out there that involves somebody's mother, both people have to have met. You have to have to know who this individual is to be able to share knowledge of that. Um, in, That's right. Thinking about different different um, different modes of communication, I interviewed Michio Kaku last week and he was really excited about the idea of um, contact lenses of the future the contact lenses in the future would allow us to overlay information so instead of um, this uh, interface that would bring information to us or allow us to uh, 
I guess, internalize information from other individuals through new, new modes of communication, that this would overlay information over our environment, allow us to see information about the weather, or uh, you look at a storefront and you see the prices of objects in the storefront, or it gives you some kind of uh, a lot more interactivity with the environment as you walk through it. And so I just want to leave you to think about this question for a moment. I do need to take a word for our, from our sponsor very briefly and um, hopefully get your answer when we come back. So if you'll just stay, stay tuned for just one second, Michael, I'm going to okay. very, I don't very... See if I can fix my camera in the meantime. <laughs> okay, sounds good. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix delivers movies to your home. And that saves you time, money, and hassle. You can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies. So these can be streamed directly to your PC or your Mac or streamed to your TV via a Netflix-ready device. You can have an Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii, I think a Roku box, all sorts of devices out there that will help you get your Netflix. You can also get DVDs delivered to you by mail in about one business day. Watch as many movies as you want anytime you want and there are never any late fees and no due dates well if you're downloading it streaming it live from from netflix yeah there's nothing to return right nothing that has to be due so uh this week i'd like to i'd like to get our uh let's see we need a move i didn't pick a streaming pick of the week but people have been talking about ghost in the shell so hopefully let me see if netflix has Ghost in the Shell. I'm going to go to netflix.com, N-E-T-F-L-I-X.com, and search for Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell. I can play it instantly. Add to my instant queue. That easy. I can play it right now. So those of you interested this week, I absolutely recommend Ghost in the Shell if you have not seen it or if you are a fan, watch it again. You can download it, watch it instantly from Netflix. It's a it's uh, it's a fun movie. It's a Japanese anime. If you haven't uh, if you if you aren't familiar with it, it's a beautifully animated movie. Um, additionally, it's a it's a great storyline. A little bit hard to follow. It's uh, very artistic you could say, but it has some great groundings in technology and where uh, where technology might be taking us. So give you some food to food for thought. You can instantly watch this movie or choose from the thousands of other movies and TV episodes that are available on Netflix when you register for a free trial membership today. Go to netflix.com forward slash twit, T-W-I-T. Sign up for your free trial at netflix.com forward slash twit. And I definitely thank Netflix for their support of Twit and Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Now back to the show. I'm still Michael, here. You're still here. Fantastic. So um, before I took the brief break, I asked you about your thoughts on, um, uh, I guess, on less of a, an internalized communication device and more of an interactive device, say the contact lenses of the future. What, um, Where do you see those headed and have you heard anything about research that could make these these kinds of things possible? Well, I read his book, Physics of the Future, just a couple of weeks ago. So I've read that whole discussion in the book. Um, and by the way, I am still flying blind. I, I should add, this is the best possible proof that my cochlear implants actually work, because I can't <laughs> read you. So I'm doing the same thing entirely in the audio right now. So it's a high wire act. Um, well, yes, I, I read that whole bit about physics of the future. And I think that Kaku is something talked about something very different than what I talked about in, in my book. So I'm going to change the subject. Now, I want to talk about something that I think is a really key part of my book. Um, you brought this up earlier in, in our conversation. You asked the question, mm -hmm. are people afraid that technology is alienating us from each other? And so that is one of the key issues that worldwide mind tackles so here's where here's where i'm coming from so there there is evidence that technology is making us less willing to talk with each other intensively that is making us more distractible that is making us basically giving us artificial add technological add so i asked the question well if you have these technologies that i write about the book which allow you to know other people's feelings at a distance, 
doesn't that just make the problem a thousand times worse? Does it put us into that nightmarish dystopia of EM Forster's novel, The Machine Stops, where everyone spends their entire lives shut alone in a room, endlessly teleconferencing with other people, never actually seeing people? So the answer is very possibly yes. I mean, I think that we do have this urge to connect to our devices and avoid the messy, inconvenient realities of other people. So there's a very strong humanistic thread in the book. I say that that really the only way to avoid that siren call of technology is to actually spend time learning how to communicate with each other. So as a, for me, as a deaf man, communication has always been an issue in my life. I've always had to struggle to feel included in groups. I've always had to work hard to hear people. So it's been very much a motif of my own life. So it really underlies the book. So I talk about these communication workshops that I did in California, which of course some people are going to think are just totally touchy-feely. But it's an interesting contrast because in the book I talk about the ultimate in high-tech and low-touch, which are these futuristic technologies I'm talking about. And I contrast that in a running thread through the book, the ultimate low-tech, high-touch existence, where the technology was purely of the body of learning how to look into people's eyes, learning how to really listen to people as they talked instead of just running your own inner monologue. And for me, that was a very profound experience. It really helped me come to grips with some of my own issues from having grown up deaf. But it also made me realize that there is no shortcut, that if we are going to create a high-tech society that is also humane, we can't rely on technology to do it for us. That we actually have to think about concretely training people in communication skills. So that's a major thing in the book, and I just wanted to make that point. I, I think it's a very valid point. Uh, it, it's probably true that we are not trained even currently and, and historically to communicate well with one another. Um, I, can't, I can't remember getting any lessons on, on how to use a phone how to talk with people, um, how, how to speak with people, how to, how to really listen. That's not something that's normally taught in, in our educational system. Um, and as we move forward, if people are going to be in their office, in their, in their home office, not really going out that often and communicating with people online while they've got a browser window open, an IRC chat window open, um, which I'm currently doing <laughs> chatting with you yeah, in my well, browser well, and with like, my yeah, irc like, like all the people in irc get off and go talk to your significant others yeah. do, it, do it right now i don't want to see anybody else anything. do you do you think though th that i mean it's technology does allow us to distance ourselves from people in terms of maybe making eye contact and actually having to hold eye contact while we communicate with somebody uh we don't actually touch because we're distanced by several thousand miles. Um, but we are able to communicate these ideas and get them uh, and have them broadcast to an audience of individuals. So in that sense, the communication is augmented. Oh, of course. And there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The only point yeah. to make is that it can't be a substitute for regular intimacy for for touch for connection for communication and, and that's where it becomes a problem you start to use it as a substitute rather than as a supplement which is what we are doing right now to great effect yeah and as some people would do substitute uh their human companionship and touch for robotic companions as well never actually having to actually come in contact with people at all um uh, well, this gets in back. fact, you know, have you have you discussed Sherry Turkle's book alone together on the show? In any no, we haven't. Mm -mm, haven't. Well, I highly recommend it because it is it is a very um, disturbing book because Turkle talks about how you can basically give senior citizens these these um, robotic pets. Yeah, and the you know they immediately transfer these feelings of affection and connection onto this completely unliving thing that has no idea that they even exist. And it's quite disturbing how how willing we are to project human emotion and feelings onto things that have no such existence. We're, we're suckers for that kind of thing. And Turkle makes that point very clearly. So we do have to very consciously work against that 
the tendency. And that's really hard in our civilization because there are so many reasons not to. There's so many distractions. As you say, it's very easy to work alone at home in a home office, which is exactly what this is, mm -hmm. and never actually connect with anybody. We're, we're really at risk of creating a society of people who don't know how to relate to each other. Do you have any suggestions and do you give any in the book for uh, increasing our, uh, our willingness to connect with people even while we're increasing our online connectedness? Well, it's a hard road. I don't make suggestions in the book. I tell my story of how I learned to do it. And I think it's a path that many people would be unwilling to take because I took these workshops that were very intensively about communication. And it's scary. I mean, there were exercises where you would sit across from first and look into their eyes for two full minutes. And that's really hard to do. Ironically, I may be coming across much better in this interview right now because I'm actually looking directly into the camera and making direct eye contact, where yep. normally with Skype, you don't because you're looking at the screen where the camera is above your line of view. So you only look a little bit sort of off like that. So ironically, the fact that I can't see you may mean I'm coming across better in this interview. <laughs> but anyway, the path that I took um, was a very challenging path. It was really a quest to expose myself to experiences where I really have nothing else to do except pay attention to a person, which is so scary that I think many people will do everything they can to avoid it. So that's the path that I took. And I think that's what gives the book its humanity because I tell that story in a very frank and a very human kind of way. I don't recommend it. It's not, I mean, I don't recommend it for everybody. It's not for everybody. But that's what I do in the book. I just tell my story. And I think that everyone has to find their own path one way or another. And uh, it, it says in your, in your bio uh, online that you, that you don't draw any distinctions between you know, science and technology and humanity. Um, how, how is it that you find a blurring or how do you define the, uh, I guess, the coexistence or, or parallel nature of humanity and technology and how it's moving forward? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, of course, that comes back to the whole C.P. Snow, his distinction of the two cultures. And you saw this sundering of the humanities and technologists, and they, they were drifting right. further and further apart. Right. Um, so that's, that's clearly the background there. Oh. How are you going? So what my mind, it interweaves technology and the personal memoir that I was just talking about, my story of these workshops. So it's not that half the book is just about these workshops, the other half is about these exotic technologies like optogenetics, which I talked about at length. It's a genetic modifi modification of neurons to make them response, respond to light. I talk about right. these incredibly exotic technologies. But in the book, I interweave the stories that I tell of my own experiences and my explications of these extremely exotic technologies. And I try to do it in such a way that when I was talking about the technology, there was also a discourse from them that was also talking about human feelings. Like people are exploring these technologies because they want to create these new kinds of connections. And in the workshop, I talked about the fact that I was in a rigorously non-technological environment. So I tried to make these two stories point at each other, to try to mm -hmm. fuse the human story with the science and technology story. So it's kind of like you read a page and a half of technology, and then you read another page and a half where I'm talking about my experiences in Northern California. And then there's another page and a half where I'm talking about the, exo you know, the science of memory in Eric Kandel. Mm -hmm. So there is this very rapid interleaving where I'm trying to make all of these things carry the same story. So it's a very deliberate rhetorical strategy in the book of how I do it. And I haven't seen very many books that do that. And I think that was one reason why the book was so hard to write, because I was trying to write a kind of book of which there are very few examples out there. Well, I hope that, I hope that people find it, find it interesting and appreciate the style. And do you think that the, uh, that the way you've written it um, uh, ends up arguing against in its in its style and in the the existence of the book ends up uh, I guess putting up an argument against C.P. Snow bringing everything together and 
helping people to envision a way that humanity and humanity and technology exist together. I would like to think so. Yes. Um, it, it do try to embody that kind of integration in the book. I mean, it's right there in the title, The Coming Integration of Humanity, Machines, and the Internet. So the book is very much about that kind of integrative thinking. I was very inspired by the philosopher Ken Wilber, who, who created this really fascinating architectonic kind of philosophy where he tried to show how scientific thinking and creative meditational kind of thinking did not have to be thought of as existing in completely different universes, that they were rather different ways of accessing what is ultimately the same reality. So I do make some references to that philosophical structure in the book. Okay, and thinking about this, we're getting towards the end of the hour, thinking about the um, all of this in a very, very futurist sense, do you have optimistic uh, per, uh an optimistic perspective on where we are going as a as a, a mm -hmm. people as hum as humans or do you think that there's a lot of work that we still need to do well both both obviously but the book is very it, it is very optimistic um i i use this um so so there's the whole idea of the board in star trek mm -hmm. which is sort of the, it's sort of become the classic nightmare scenario of a dehumanized species which has become so mastered by its technology that it has lost its humanity. And so I use that as an example of precisely the kind of future that I think we need to avoid. I see it as a possible future. Um, I see us as being on the track to that kind of future because we so easily allow ourselves to be seduced by our technologies. But in the book, I am very optimistic that we will find a way around that. And I look at things like Twitter, for example, which I think are very powerful technologies for connection that is really emotional and imagistic. Twitter is very new. It is, it is really just beginning. But I, in the book, I offer the analogy that Twitter is becoming a kind of collective amygdala for the human species. Nice. Now, the amygdala is the part of the brain that modulates emotional responses. It's the part of the brain that helps communicate that the brain is having strong emotional response to other parts of the brain. So I offer the suggestion that Twitter is a primitive amygdala in that it is the part of the internet that is becoming the part of the collective human and machine society, which is bringing feelings and responses and sensory impressions into the mix. So I do hope that we are going in that direction where we are getting closer to our feelings than things that connect us as human beings instead of simply further and further away. So I do in the long run have hope that we will become a more connected, a wiser, more capacious species rather than an increasingly alienated one. So Worldwide Mind is a very optimistic book. I love that idea of, the, of, the, of Twitter as our collective amygdala. I've, uh, I've talked about it as uh, a working memory or a short-term memory, but in terms of uh, the potential for sharing emotions, that's, that's not a direction that I'd, I'd considered it in before. So that's, I like, I'm, I'm going to be left with that thought as we, as we close out the show. Give me something to think about for the rest of the, rest of the afternoon here. Um, any, is there anything else that, uh, that you want to tell people about Worldwide Mind? I think it's, uh, it's just, is a, it sounds like a fascinating, fascinating coverage of the subject, and um, I hope people will take a look at it to give them food for thought for, uh, you know, where we are going, how we are going to integrate our technology into our human future. Did you well, that's a great note in which to end it. I mean, I do encourage people to buy the book and to read it. It is a daring <laughs> book. It's a risky book. I took a lot of risks in this in this book because it tells very personal stories. And different people have different responses to that. But I hope that you will read the book. And I hope, if you like it, you will post nice reviews of it on Amazon. <laughs> that's exactly right. Nice reviews, everybody. We like the nice reviews. And Michael, it's been so great connecting with you once again. It's been a long time since we've spoken, so it's been a, just a real pleasure for me to, to speak with you once again and have the benefit of your brilliance. Well, thank you, Kiki. I'm blushing. I appreciate that. 
<laughs> Thank you. And everybody who is interested in uh, finding out more about Worldwide Mind or about uh, Michael's previous books or anything else that he's working on, you can go to his website, michaelchorist.com. Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, Chorist, C-H-O-R-O-S-T.com. He is also Mike Chorist on Twitter. Uh, and... I urge you to follow him because he has some very interesting, interesting things to say. And, um, and I, I, I think we all need interesting things in our lives. Um, I am Dr. Kiki, and this has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Next week, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Mark Changizi. We'll be speaking about some, some fun stuff, uh, questioning science and, uh, and trying to push the boundaries of science a little bit further. So... Looking forward to speaking with him next week. Until then, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Kiki, D R K I K I. And you can find my Facebook fan page, Dr. Kiki. That's what I am on Facebook and my website, drkiki.tv. You can subscribe to this program, Dr. Kiki Science Hour, on iTunes. And you can find past episodes at twit.tv forward slash Kiki, K I K I. If you need even more sciencey goodness, because goodness knows one hour a week just isn't enough for so many of us, you can also listen to This Week in Science, which can be found at twist.org, T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. I'll be back here next week and look forward to seeing you, um, at least seeing you in the chat room, talking with you through the airwaves, the, uh, the internet waves, I guess we could call them. Thanks for tuning in to the Science Hour. Remember, all I ask is one hour a week. And remember, one hour a week makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Thanks a lot. See you later. Three, two, one. Would you be a cyborg? Wait, wait, that's not what I want to do. That's a different tease that I didn't do. Hold on. Okay, I got it. (laughs) Got it, really. <laughs>